This episode of Under the Apron is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard yet, Anchor by Spotify is the easiest way to make a podcast with all the tools you need, all in one place. Just type in anchor.fm on your browser and start creating that podcast that you've been talking about starting all year long. Take advantage of Anchor's creation tools. You can record, edit, add music, or any type of audio you like right from your phone or computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast on many different listening platforms, such as Spotify, Apple, Google, or even Stitcher. And that's just to name a few. It's everything you need to make a podcast. And want to know what's the best part about it? Absolutely, totally free. Join us and download the Anchor app on your phone or go to anchor.fm on your browser to get started right away. Link will be in the show notes. When people hear that I have a podcast, they immediately react a few ways. One is, oh, this guy just wants to push his podcast on me. You don't listen to podcasts. We get it. I get it. It's why I put it in my bio. So if they are ever interested in knowing what I'm about, the first thing they will read is podcaster. After a full year of doing this, I would like to associate myself as a podcaster. I think it's only right to introduce myself as such to strangers. Hi, my name is Ernie and I'm a podcaster. That's my job. That's how I get paid. Uh, the other way to react is, oh, you have a podcast. What is it about? They are interested. I have their attention because they also listen to podcasts. And sometimes the own one they listen to is kind of getting stale, you know? I'm sorry. I talk with my hands all the time. Uh, kind of like mine is right now at this moment. We'll talk about that later. Uh, so I have to throw in with the starter, the bait. Is there such thing as a catfish for podcast? <laughs> because I feel that's exactly what I did, what I've done, what I've done this past week. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, catfish is when you pretend to be something you're not to create false identity. Sometimes it's to pursue online romances. Other times you just want to be on the catfish show. I feel like I created a podfish so to speak, to my account these past few days. When people have asked, I told them it's about wrestling, but it has evolved into this whole thing about my health, movies, TV shows, and games. I don't lie, I just didn't tell them the whole truth. I still about wrestling, I just failed to mention that I'm talking about those wrestlers in these movies, <laughs> TV shows, and video games, you know? The only thing that stays true is my health, my diabetes. Coming soon, more side quests, I promise I keep saying that. My last wrestling with diabetes segment was in August. Should I do more? Am I interested in doing more? Stay tuned for more, perhaps. As for the stale part, it happens. I get it. I wasn't getting any listeners in January of last year when I first started, so I don't expect it to change this year. So I get the whole stale situation. Perhaps it's time for another change to the podcast, maybe, perhaps.
I'm here to get drunk. <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. I have about half a cup of vodka. Yeah. Drink, drink, drink. <laughs> Wait, are we live? Hi, yeah. I'm Jessica. One professional skill that I would really like to learn yeah. is stripping. I'm Sonia. Because, like, I'm okay with not being artistic. Like, I'm just like, that's cool. And I'm Don Marie. And we are Opinionated Lushes. I'll, I'll make a, I'll make a yeah. tomato oh. vodka soup. Ooh. Also known as like a Caesar. (laughs) (laughs) Once a week, we get together to drink and talk shit. We start our episodes off with a question and a drink word. We usually never stay on topic or wait for the drink word to start drinking. You're already breaking the game. There's a new episode of Opinionated Lushes every Friday on all streaming platforms. Just testing mattresses. Why isn't that a job? (laughs) It, It probably is. An unedited episode Saturday on YouTube. You just want to tell people you love them? <laughs> yeah, sometimes <laughs> sounds, you need it. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. Have a cocktail suggestion? A topic of interest? A good drinking word? Feel free to DM us on Instagram or email us at opinionatedlushes at gmail.com. If I don't know you, I will. <laughs> so go ahead, grab a drink, any kind of drink, and get ready to laugh with us and share our drunken opinions. Hi everyone, this is JJ, the co-founder of Good Pods. If you haven't heard of it yet, Good Pods is like Goodreads or Instagram, but for podcasts. It's new, it's social, it's different, and it's growing really fast. There are more than 2 million podcasts, and we know that it is impossible to figure out what to listen to. On Good Pods, you follow your friends and podcasters to see what they like. That is the number one way to discover new shows and episodes. You can find Good Pods on the web or download the app. Happy listening. Welcome back, podcasting geeks. This is another incredible new episode where not everything looks as it seems when you try to record from under the apron. (laughs) Royal Rumble is coming up next weekend. So here we are with another of my favorite Rumble moments. I'm going to try and post more Rumble episodes even after January to keep up. Before I even continue, you heard me shout out a lot of podcasters and people last week towards the final moments of the show. Here's a plot twist. They don't even know I'm doing this until they listen to this particular part of the show. So, big... Shout out to the following people for sending me gifts on the live on Tumblr. They don't even know I'm doing this. Hopefully, if the app ever decides to record your videos, I can post this on the YouTube. Which, by the way, big congrats to them. The YouTube channel has 166 subscribers. You guys should check that out from Under the Apron. Link in the bio. Link in the show notes. If you are not one of those, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. The link will be in the show notes along with the link tree of all the socials I'm currently in. Uh, Before I get to the shout out, I'm not going to tell you why. Just know that these amazing people are supporters of me and I want to return the favor by name dropping them on my podcast. Whether they're from TikTok, Kick, Instagram, Tumblr Live. They are awesome for doing so. Thank y'all for your support. Here they are. Mr. Antics. Celestial Moon Goddess. Troll King. Obi Silence and Black. Goody Girl. Miniature Dancer 51. And the Fair Bear Show. As well as John Decor. Uh, and I always said I needed a hype person in my life, a hype guy or a hype girl, and this person has been such a hype since I met her, so I'm going to give her a shout out and hope that she's listening, or I'll just send it to her and she can hype me up some more. (laughs) My favorite hype girl and a friend of the podcast, Hydrange Water, I'm going to have her link as well as everyone that is a supporter in the show notes, so you can follow them either on Twitter Instagram, or any of those socials that they have. Okay, so a few nights ago, I streamed Royal Rumble 94, as well as Royal Rumble 95, just for the hell of it, to see how it would go. 
I decided to do another wrestling event, and it went pretty well. So I may do that again. I know there are a few memorable moments about this Royal Rumble 1994. And one of them is the Levitaker scene and the winner of the Royal Rumble, which if you haven't seen it yet, you should go give it a watch. If this is your first time listening, let me tell you what we usually do. At the end of the show, we will rank this entire pay-per-view and do what myself and my co-host used to do back in the 90s, and that's record these pay-per-views on VHS and take them to school with us the next day and let our close friends that don't have cable borrow them. We wouldn't get them back until Friday that week. They would still be passed around by Wednesday due to others wanting to watch. We were heavy, heavy, heavy on the tape distribution back then. And would either take them to school and let your friends borrow it, or the paper you sucked, we didn't tell them to skip the whole fucking shit. <laughs> and wait until Rod the next night to find out their results. Some paper views we said that we would tell them to fast forward the entire tape until they get to a specific match. Something that myself and my co host Michael have done in our high school years. Royal Rumble 1994 took place on Saturday, January 22. 1994 at the Providence Civic Center in Providence, Rhode Island. This was the last World Rumble held on a Saturday night until January 29th, 2022. The show opens up on Vince McMahon doing commentary, but not alone as there are always a heel commentator in the booth. Out comes Ted DiBiase. DiBiase had left the company after SummerSlam 1993. Departing for All Japan Pro Wrestling, where he and Stan Hansen quickly won the promotion's tag belts. Within months of his arrival, DiBiase injured his two cervical discs and was forced to drop out of the annual World's Strongest Tag Determination League tournament in November. Around his 40th birthday in January 1994, DiBiase had opted to retire. Days later, with WWE needing a heel announcer due to the departure of Bobby the Brain Heenan, in absence of Jerry Lawler, DiBiase got the call to come back. The first match of the night was supposed to be Ludwig Borga versus Zatanka. The two were engaged in a feud that began prior to Survivor Series 1993. I talked a little bit about this last year on episode 67. Zatanka had been undefeated in the WWF since his debut in 1991. Borga ended this streak on the October 30th edition of the WWF Superstars, taped on September 28th, 1993, when he hit Tatanka with a steel chair while the referee was distracted. As a result of storyline injuries from this attack and the beating he suffered afterward at the hands of Borga and Yokozuna, Tatanka was forced to miss the main event match at Survivor Series. Although Tatanka defeated Borga by disqualification on the December 20th, 1993 edition of Monday Night Raw. The bitterness between the two remained. Unfortunately, Borga suffered a legit ankle injury and was replaced by Bam Bam Bigelow. Although the substitution took place shortly before the event, Bigelow and Tatanka had a reheated rivalry. In 1993, Bigelow had cut Tatanka's dyed red hair as an insult to his Lumbee heritage. The two faced each other as part of a six-man match at SummerSlam 93, but the feud continued even after Tatanka's team emerged victorious. Tatanka defeated Bam Bam Bigelow. Eight minutes and 12 seconds. Not bad for a last-minute substitution match. Like, there's the reason for it, because... Uh, Tatanka's original opponent, Ludwig Borga, had injured his fucking ankle. So, Bam Bam was already scheduled to be in the Rumble, and shows up in the main event of the casket match and takes a few bumps from Undertaker. Um, like it or not, Bam Bam is the MVP of this night. Uh, during the match, Bigelow tried to attack Tatanka before the bell, but Tatanka moved. The two fought back and forth, and Bigelow gained momentum after Tatanka missed a crossbody from the top turnbuckle. Bigelow used his weight to keep the advantage, sitting at Tatanka and later using a bear hug 
to wear him down. After the two hit each other with simultaneous crossbodies, the Tonga began a war dance. <sighs> Basically, he walked out. <laughs> like Hulk Hogan used to do, he would like shake the rope, shake himself, and Hulk out. And while Hulk Hogan was out of somewhere making a show, the Tonka began doing this whole thing where he would Hulk out as well. They called it the war dance. Uh, so Bigelow kicked the Tonka in the back of the head to regain the advantage, but missed a moonsault attempt from the top rope, allowing the Tonka to perform a crossbody from the corner and get the victory. Next match, the Quebecers Jacques and Pierre defeated Brett and Owen Hart for the WWE Tag Team Championship. The little match lasted 16 minutes and 48 seconds. At Survivor Series 1993, Owen Hart was eliminated during an elimination match when he crashed into his bro brother, Bret Hart, who was walking along the ring apron, causing Owen to lose his focus and be pinned by Michaels. After the match, Owen interrupted his brother's victory celebration to verbally attack Brett. He demanded a match with Brett to settle the dispute. Brett, Brett refused and the brothers reunited over the Christmas holidays. They decided to focus their energy on taking the tag team title from the Quebecers. Their plan was temporarily put on hold when Marginetti and the 123 Kid won the belts. But the Quebecers won a rematch the following week, guaranteeing that the Hearts would get their title shot. Alright, the fun fact about this match is that Jacques from the Quebecers has never participated in the Royal Rumble match. Every match that he has ever been in during the Royal Rumble pay-per-view has been for either the Intercontinental Championship or the Tag Team titles. Uh... The match started slowly, but both teams soon began brawling in the ring. The heart focused on Pierre, but Jacques was eventually able to tag in to rescue him. After Pierre regained the advantage, Owen tagged in and took control of the match. He applied a sharpshooter to Jacques, but Pierre broke the hold. Brett tagged in, but fell out of the ring. Kayfabe hurt his knee when the Quebecers managed to pull on the ropes. The Quebecers focused on Brett's knee until Brett regained the advantage and attempted to apply the sharpshooter. He was not able to stand, however, so the referee stopped the match and awarded the victory to the Quebecers. After the match, Owen yelled at Brett for not tagging out of the match. He then turned on Brett by kicking his injured leg and leaving him lying in the ring. This left fans wondering if Bret Hart would even make the Royal Rumble match itself. Right, here's the fucking moment I found hilarious. The moment I found hilarious came after the match when Owen has swept Brett's leg and laid him out in the middle of the ring being looked at by personnel and everybody. Ray Rougeau, who was an interview guest in the ring and tries to get a word with Brett, who is riding in pain. And Pat Patterson is telling him to go away, get out of my face, leave him alone. They're trying to check on him. For those that don't know, Ray Rougeau is the brother of Jacques Rougeau, who has just been in a match with Brett. So Ray and Jacques used to be a team called the Fabulous Rougeaus. So I'm sitting there like, your brother just whooped his ass and his brother just destroyed his knee some more. What else do you want from him? You know? That's ridiculous. I love the match. I enjoy the match. But at the same time, it was like, Owen Hart's heel turn, so it had to happen to where his Brett is like, no, I'm not going to attack you in. So Owen decides, all right, I'm going to beat your ass some more. Next match is Razor Ramon defeated IRS Erwin R. Scheister for the Intercontinental Championship at 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Razor Ramon and Erwin R. Scheister began feuding prior to SummerSlam 1993. Because of an angle in which Money Inc., the team of Ted DiBiase and RS, teased Ramon about losing to the 123 Kid, a newcomer to the WWF. Their heated rivalry, the rivalry heated up when IRS told Ramon gold chains, while Shawn Michaels had Ramon distracted. 
Ramon and IRS agreed to settle the feud at Royal Rumble 94 with Ramon's Intercontinental Championship on the line. As for the reason Shawn Michaels is involved in this storyline is because Michaels never lost the Intercontinental Championship. He was forced to vacate it um, around October, September. Uh, in September of 1993, Michaels was suspended for a testing positive for steroid, a charge he never admitted. On WWF programs, his suspension was explained by his having neglected to defend the title often enough. So the IC Championship was held up during a 20-man battle royal in which Razor Ramon and Rick Martel became the last two men. The match was stopped and it would continue the following week for the IC Championship in which Razor Ramon won. When Shawn Michaels came back, he claimed to be the rightful champion and even carried around his old title belt. Uh, for this match, Jim Ross and Gorilla Monsoon took over for commentary roles. The match began with a brawl between the two and Ramon got the early advantage. Shyster, IRS, eventually threw Ramon over the top rope and attacked him on the floor. IRS kept control of the match for quite a while, applying a reverse chin lock while using the ring ropes for additional leverage. After Ramon escaped the hold, he was able to perform a fallaway slam on Shyster. He then used an Irish whip to throw Shyster into the corner, but the match turned around with a ref bump when Je referee Joy Morello was in the way and was kayfabe knocked unconscious. Shawn Michaels ran to the ring with his fake Intercontinental Championship belt and hit Ramon with it, and Shyster helped revive Morella to count the pinfall. IRS appeared to win the title, but referee Earl Hebner came to the ring and explained the situation to Morella when Michael's belt was discovered in the ring. The match was restarted. Ramon simply grabbed Shyster, who was standing on the second turnbuckle, celebrating performed the Razor's Edge for the victory. Uh, Razor Ramon and Shawn Michaels were eventually settled with the real champion, who the real champion is, at WrestleMania 10 in a ladder match. Uh, listen to episode 13 for more and anything to do with WrestleMania 10. We talk about that ladder match and how it went over 10 extra minutes, not allowing the other wrestlers to participate. Uh, main event time. Yokozuna defeated The Undertaker in a casket match for the WWE Championship at 14 minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, backstory. The rivalry between Yokozuna and The Undertaker began at Survivor Series 1993. Yokozuna, who was pushed as an unstoppable monster was unable to inflict any serious damage on The Undertaker when the two faced each other in an elimination match. Yokozuna slammed The Undertaker's head onto the steel steps leading up to the ring, but The Undertaker was unharmed. Later, Yokozuna used his finishing move, the Bunzai Drop, on The Undertaker. When he tried to repeat the move, however, The Undertaker became the first wrestler to sit up after the move, surprising Yokozuna and his managers. The Undertaker was granted a title shot in a casket match. In the following week, it was revealed that Yokozuna had a fear of caskets. The Undertaker used this knowledge to gain a physical, physical, a psychological advantage going into the match. On one occasion, Paul Bear brought the casket to the ring to intimidate Yokozuna. When Yokozuna appeared, approached the casket to face his fear, the Undertaker popped out to scare Yokozuna. All right, the cool the rules of a casket match goes as follows: the first wrestler to get his opponent in the casket and close the lid will win the match and the WWF World Heavyweight Championship. <laughs> of course, as stated in episode 12, Bret Hart had said that Yokozuna would only last. 10 minutes in this match, so much could be said in the same thing about this match. It didn't suck, but Yokozuna can go. Yokozuna had great difficulty inflicting any serious damage on the Undertaker, but it was soon revealed that Mr. Fuji had arranged for several wrestlers to get involved on Yokozuna's behalf. About 10 minutes into the match, Crush, the Great Kabuki, Jankiro Tenryu, and Bam Bam Bigelow interfered. 
But the Undertaker was able to fight back until Mr. Fuji stole the Undertaker's urn from Paul Bear. Yokozuna opened the urn and smoke poured out. Meanwhile, Adam Bomb, Jeff Jarrett, the head shrinker Simon Winfa 2, and Diesel? Who came in at the last minute? Uh, why is he there? <laughs> came, came to help eventually? Uh, sure. Um, Yokozuna's allies were able to shut the Undertaker in the casket to end the match. They locked the casket and pushed it down the aisle until smoke started coming out of the casket. The Undertaker appeared on the video screen at the end of the aisle, vowing to return. The casket was shown exploding on the screen, although the casket in the arena did not explode. After the explosion was shown, a person resembling the Undertaker was seen rising up to the ceiling of the Civic Center. For years, the belief was that it was Marty Jannetty, thanks to his water mane and hair playing the role of Levitaker as he ascended toward the great beyond. Apparently, Jannetty answered the fans' questions on Facebook sometime in the last few years <laughs> regarding the moment. And Jannetty claimed that it was Steve Brooklyn Brawler Lombardi who was dressed as the ascendant version of the Undertaker, Levitaker, so to speak. It was also a coincidence that Ted DiBiase was on commentary when this occurred. He brought Undertaker into the WWF at Survivor Series, and you saw him go here at the Royal Rumble. Undertaker did not appear in the WWF for several months after his loss to Yoko Luna. In reality, he was given time off to allow a back injury to heal. During his absence, the WWF promoted his return by showing video clips of people who claimed to have seen The Undertaker. Ted DiBiase claimed to have brought The Undertaker back to the WWF, but Paul Bear informed him that DiBiase the Undertaker was an imposter. Imposter. He's a fake. He sits on a uh, throne of lies. <laughs> Paul Bear claimed that look at the true Undertaker, which led to a match at SummerSlam 1994 between DiBiase's Undertaker portrayed by ECW's Brian Lee and Paul Bear's original Undertaker. You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. Mama Murdered a Podcast is a podcast where me, the mama, will be killing it on the podcast. We're taking a deep dive into things that are hard to talk about and even harder to believe that these things actually happen in the world that we live in. This entire podcast will be a trigger warning. I'll be talking about triggering topics while I dive headfirst into a lot of the cases that I'll be covering. New episodes will be released every week on Wednesdays because... Well, because nobody likes Mondays and because Fridays are for day drinking and barbecues. Some of the case topics will be murder, of course, serial killers like Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, missing persons cases like five-year-old Summer Wells who vanished from her own yard in broad daylight in the middle of June in Tennessee in 2021, and especially the ones where it kind of seems like they just vanished into thin air, like Brian Schaefer. He walked into a bar, but he never walked out. He's still never been seen again. I'll also be covering cold cases and lesser-known cases. Join me every Wednesday to talk about all things tragic, murder, and things that happen in the down right ugliest sides of society. If you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast, you can rate me on Spotify. You can also leave a review and rating on Apple Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at murdered underscore mama. All of these things are free and they only take about a second to do and it really does help grow the podcast. If you have any case suggestions, please send them my way. You can send them to the email address podcast at gmail.com. Hey guys, this is Ernie. We're going to get to the next segment in a few, but let me tell you about Dark Fade Creations, okay? Dark Fade Creations would like to invite you to a new and unique experience in candles and wax melts. They hand pour and create every single product using quality, clean, and safe ingredients. Their candles are fueled with romantic wooden wicks and made with a coconut soy blend of waxes for a safer, cleaner, and longer burn. The designs are unique and beautiful, but more importantly, they smell absolutely amazing. And the variety of fragrances have something for everyone. Hand poured in Grass Valley, California. Check them out at darkfakecreations.com. Link of the site in the show notes below.
All right, the Royal Rumble itself lasted this year for 55 minutes. I'm not going to tell you who the winner is on this one until the very last moment. Because then it'll just ruin the whole thing. Uh, up until this year, every Royal Rumble, a new wrestler would come out every two minutes to keep the show going. The rules were changed via WF President Jack Tunney. He's still president who announced that it was shortened to 90 seconds due to time constraints. Also, it needs to be noted that Lex Luger wanted to participate in the Royal Rumble match, as the winner was scheduled to get a title shot for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship at WrestleMania 10. The contract he has signed for his title shot at SummerSlam 93, however, stated that he would not receive a rematch if he failed to win a title. A compromise was reached, allowing Luger to compete, Yokozuna's manager, Mr. Fuji, was allowed to bring in two wrestlers, Jedekira Tenryu, who'd been there before, the past World Rumbles, and the great Kabuki to hurt Luger's chances of winning. Um, Alright, I'm just going to announce... Well, yeah, we could do that. Usually I say that... I'm not going to tell you how this whole thing went because of time constraints, but there's no one with me, so we're going to do it anyway. We're going to go through it. We're going to hold through the whole thing. Number one and number two. I'm just going to put in the audio right now of Headbanger. Well, boys, we got ourselves a good old-fashioned Headbanger. So, here it is. Number one, Scott Steiner. Number two, Samu. Already a Headbanger. Both of them throwing some hard punches and kicks. Scott Steiner's not yet the big bad booty daddy that we know him as now, but he was a bit smaller at this era. Um, he whooped Samu's ass. Number three, Rick Steiner, Scott's brother. He slowly makes his way to the ring while Samu is trying to throw Scott out of the ring. Like, dude, hurry up and help your brother. Just reminds me of when Jeff Hardy came out dancing but he was supposed to go save his brother and this is an AEW. Uh once he gets in the ring he helps his brother out. They don't touch each other and it's not a triple threat. It just feels like a two on one handicap match the entire time. Scott throws Samu into the ropes. They try for a double Klaus line. Samu ducks it and on the way back he tries to cross body block them but they move out of the way and he goes through the ropes and gets his head stuck in between the top and second rope. Ah, uh, he's damn. Uh, number four, Quang. As you all remember from the 90s era, these new wrestlers that came in. But it was actually Savio Vega who subbed in for Ludwig Borga because his poor ankle, eh, I can't wrestle anymore. Scott Steiner helps out Samu, but pushes him off the ring apron to the floor. Scott and Rick stare at each other, and everyone's waiting to see if they're going to fight each other, but Quang gets in the ring. Quang spits a green mist on Rick, but Scott punches Quang into the corner, and they proceed to help each other out. Hey there, Tyler Saw 69 how you doing? Welcome. Number five, Owen Hart, who comes out to a chorus of booze. Due to what he did earlier in the night. He goes after Rick Steiner. Since he's blind and tosses him out. After he goes after Scott Steiner. Uh, number six. Bart Gunn. Who goes after Owen Hart. And helps Scott Steiner. Who is getting double teamed by Quang and Owen. Uh, number seven. Diesel. Who goes straight to work. And punches out everyone in the ring. Tosses out Bart Gunn, followed by Scott Steiner and Owen. Wait. Bart Gunn, Scott Steiner, Owen Hart, and clothesline Quang out of the ring before the countdown reaches zero. That's four already. He's already just taking out everybody in there. Uh, countdown reaches zero. I'm just not going to say why he's just standing there, just like looking at his glove, fixing it. But... Number eight is Bob Backlund, who uses wrestling moves to outmaneuver Diesel and almost tosses him out. But Diesel p 
powers out of it. He throws Backlund out of the ring right away. Oh, uh, number nine. <laughs> number nine is Daddy Ass. Scissor me, Daddy Ass. <laughs> Daddy Ass. Billy Gunn. I'm sorry, Billy Gunn. Daddy Ass runs out to the ring, gets a boot to the face, and then gets thrown out of the ring. It's done. It's over with. Teasel just waits out for another, for number 10 to come out. That's that's six people already. Cameras show backstage where Kabuki and Tenryu are jumping on like who were in the hallway. Uh, number 10, Virgil, who was a sub for Kamala. He runs to the ring, outsmarts, tries to outsmart Diesel, and does some fancy boxing footwork for 30 seconds before he's eliminated by Diesel again. Why are you even there? <laughs> on commentary, Ted DiBiase is beside himself and laughs at what just happened to his former bodyguard. Remember those times? <laughs> Diesel once again waits in the ring and conserving his energy. He just threw out seven men in the past for ten minutes, perhaps, around there. Uh, number 11, Randy Savage, Macho Madness. Last year in the Rumble before he leaves for Greener Pasture for TWW to join Hulk Hogan. Oh yeah, brother. Uh, hopefully they explain the rules to much on how the Royal Rumble works this time. <laughs> uh, a few years prior, he I talked to, about this in the last episode of the Royal Rumble matches that we had. Uh, a few years prior, he jumped out of the ring by himself to fucking go after... Jake the Snake Roberts. Then they put him back in the ring, which was weird itself. Uh, a year ago, 1993, I think. Yeah. Uh, he elbow drops Yokozuna and tries to cover him for a count. And the Royal Rumble, dude? He doesn't know the rules exactly. He just does whatever he wants. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, number 12, Jeff Jarrett. Before the countdown begins, Savage throws Jarrett into Diesel, who is still trying to recuperate from the beating Savage gave him. Jarrett gets taken out by Savage and goes back to attacking Big Sexy Kevin Nash. Uh, Big Daddy Cool, I mean. Uh, number 13, Crush, who runs the ring, goes after Savage. But Savage beats him to it, and they go at it. Diesel helps Crush. He throws Savage out of the ring. Okay, number 14. Doink the Clown, who comes out with Dink and Diesel. is already trying to throw out Crush. Doink stays in the corner and laughs at both Diesel and Crush fighting each other. Number 15, Bam Bam Bigelow coming out with his main squeeze, Luna Vachon. Diesel and Crush hold the rope for Bam Bam to come inside and pummel Doink, who hoists him up over his head and throws Doink out of the ring, foreshadowing what will he will do to Spike Dudley in a few years, perhaps. Uh, immediately, Crush and Diesel try to throw out Bam Bam. Number 16, Mabel, who comes in and Diesel is ready for him. Kevin Nash has gone on record about Mabel being unsafe to work with and will give everyone an injury. We don't like Mabel around here. We really don't. He hurt just about everybody. <laughs> uh, number 17, Thurman Sparky Plug, who replaced the 1 through 3 kid. Who hurt his knee on the same night as Borga. But he only missed a month of wrestling and continued to wrestle. See how that works, Ludwig Borga. See how that works. Um, I'm sorry, he's still on Thurman Sparky Plug. Uh, I apologize. I'm sorry. Uh, perhaps you know Sparky Plug by another name. Hardcore Holly. Yes. Here he's a race car driver with a mullet. God, a mullet. Number 18, Shawn Michaels, who slides in the ring and is met with Diesel standing right in front of him, adjusting his black glove and ready to fight Michaels. Shawn backs up 
to the corner hoping that his bodyguard will back off. He gets on the top rope and tries to shake Diesel's hand. And then Bam Bam and Mabel attack Diesel from behind. And then when the ring throws Diesel out, including Shawn Michaels, who the camera catches him backing away from that mob that was throwing him out. Number 19, Mo from Man on a Mission, the other guy. Uh, there was a moment where Shawn Michaels was in the corner with Holly, punching him, kicking him, backed up to try and go somewhere else. But notice that somewhere else, including all the other big guys, Mabel, Bam Bam, and Crush. So Michaels went back to punching Holly again. Ah, <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Mo gets in the ring and helps out his partner, Mabel. Holly whips Michaels out of the ring, but Michaels holds on and does that move. That will make him famous the following year's Royal Rumble. Number 20, Greg the Ve the Hammer. Valentine, who slides in and Mabel stops him. But Valentine hammers into Mabel. Number 21, the Tonga who runs and attacks Shawn Michaels. Still sour from the outcome of WrestleMania 9. Number 22, the Great Kabuki, who is part of a team of people trying to take out me, uh Lex Luger, but he comes in to help out, take out Mabel, with the exception of Mo, who is laid out in the corner. Number 23, Lex Luger, who runs in and tosses Kabuki out of the ring. He then turns his attention on everyone else in the ring. Crush stops him and takes him to the corner. That part right there, like, okay, that's, keep in mind, that part right there, foreshadowing, so to speak. Planning a seed, I guess, is what you're calling what they call it here. Number 24, Jinikira Tenryu, who makes his way to the ring and finds Lex Luger to deliver a few massive chops. Number 25, nobody came out, unfortunately. It was reported that it was supposed to be Bastion Booger, but he didn't feel good and Vince didn't replace him. Vince McMahon on commentary made it seem that it was supposed to be Bret Hart. Number 26, Rick Martell. Nothing happened. Number 27, Bret Hart, who gets a loud pop as he limps his way to the ring, selling the knee from earlier in the night. Everyone goes after him and the knee. Number 28, Fatu Rikishi, the bloodline. <laughs> uh, Crush was about to toss Bret Hart out of the ring, but Lex Luger runs in to help him. Again, just like every year that he's been in the Rumble, Tenryu just walks around the ring lost. Why is he fucking there in the first place? Uh, meanwhile, Bam Bam Bigelow, Bret Hart, Lex Luger, and ha Hardcore Holly. I don't care what he's called here. I'm calling him Hardcore Holly. I've known him as Hardcore Holly all my life. They toss out Crush. <laughs> he's out of the ring. Number 29, we're almost done, wow. Marginetti comes out to a loud pop as well, and his first victim is Michaels, who seems like they are real punches. And finally, number 30, Adam Baum with Harvey Whippleman, also one of the stars of the hit show Young Rock, <laughs> Downtown Bruno. Um... All right, after, this is like throughout the entire match, this is what's going on. Holly was trying to throw out Michaels, but Bret Hart interferes and throws out Holly instead. It's kind of weird that shit. Kind of weird that that happened. Here you have Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, a story rivalry throughout the ages. Holly's trying to throw out Michaels, and Bret Hart comes in there to help Michaels out. Wow. Uh, wow, okay. <laughs> Rick Martell does what Thor used to do and throws the hammer out of the ring. Greg the Hammer Valentine, that is. And I, yeah, this is the point of the show where I just start using puns after puns after puns for all the other wrestlers. It's not hilarious at all. It's not funny. But I still do it anyways. The Tonka exposes the model. See what I mean? The Tonka exposes the model and throws him out. Tenryu is still walking around looking lost. Why is he there? He kicks Bret Hart on his bad knee. That's all he did. He goes around looking lost again. Lex Luger throws out Adam Baum. Fatu throws out Mo. 
Bam Bam Bigelow takes out Tatanka. At least somebody won in this match. This rivalry. Lex Luger clotheslines Bam Bam out of the ring. Uh, Shawn Michaels takes out Janetti. Bret Hart and Lex take out Tenryu, finally. Alright, the final four in the ring. HBK, Bret Hart, Lex Luger, and Fatu. Lex teams up with Bret, while Shawn teams up with Fatu to get each other out. Michaels goes after Bret first, while Fatu goes after Luger, and they stay like that for a whole while. Lex Luger whips Fatu, and Bret Hart whips Michaels onto each other, but Fatu ducks. Michael Leapfrog, and they splash, try to splash Luger and Hart, but they duck as well and then throw both of them out. This leads Bret Hart and Lex Luger in the ring to fight each other. They throw punches at each other, and then Luger hoists Hart up. He backs up. They both go over the top rope. Two referees with different stories. Joy Morella says he saw Bret Hart touch the floor first, thus making Lex Luger the winner. Which he announced first. Earl Hebner says he saw Lex Luger touch the floor first. Thus making Bret Hart the winner. Bret Hart's music is played as well. And you can tell the difference in the crowd popping for them. They like Bret Hart more than they like Luger. We talked about this on this podcast before. Uh, Vince decided on who should the champion should be based on the crowd's reaction. And Bret Hart won. Joy Morella once again raised Luger's hand and the crowd cheered. Earl Hebner raises Bret Hart's hand and the crowd cheers louder. This forces the president of the WWF, Jack Tunney, to come out and try to make sense of it all. They even go outside to replay and they still don't know who won. The Fink, the ring announcer, announces that both Lex Luger and Bret Hart are the winners of the 1994 Royal Rumble, and both will go to WrestleMania and face the WWF World Champion, Yokozuna. They're both disappointed. They both shake hands. Sore losers. Whatever. Lex Luger goes to the back, but Bret Hart stays to sign autographs and still sells the injured knee. All right, for WWE's part, director Kerwin Silfies had apparently instructed the cameraman to avoid the side of the ring to make sure that no camera definitely caught the ending in case one of the two truly did hit the floor before the other. It was a risky spot. There were two pros ex- executing it. Hart knows in the autobiography that in the two-way tumble, it was Luger that was responsible for how they angled over the ropes for the final fall since... Luger's back would be pivoting off the top rope. Hart would say it was a testament to Lex's skill and professionalism that it came off so well. Uh, MVP of the night, I said earlier, Bam Bam Bigelow, who had triple duty. He was told about his match against Tatanka at the last minute. So they had limited time. He was already interfering in the main event and got a bump from Undertaker. And then he's also in the Royal Rumble for at least 30 minutes and 12 seconds. The longest at this year's Rumble. The second longest came in at 29 minutes. And it belongs to Shawn Michaels. Wait another week and I'll tell you what he did at the 1995 Royal Rumble. Shortest time in the Rumble this year belonged to the three wrestlers that Diesel threw out. Billy Gunn at 14 seconds. Virgil at 32 seconds. And last year's Iron Man who got taken out this year at 41 seconds. The only one at Bob Beckler for one thing only last year. And that was to beat Ric Flair's record. Uh, Speaking of Diesel, he got the most out with seven wrestlers. The Affirmation Three, as well as Scott Steiner, Quang, Owen Hart, and Bart Gunn. They all made Kevin Nash look strong. Lex Luger came in second place with six people thrown out. And Bam Bam in third with five. I also did a bit more research and checked how many each wrestler has taken out throughout their careers in the Royal Rumble. I made a list of everybody that has eliminated two or more people from this Rumble. Uh, They used to come out with their statistics every year, and I don't know if they still do it, but here's what I have gathered up to this point in 1994. 
Bret Hart has taken out five uh, one-man gang, also known as Hakeem, Hakeem, the African Dream, uh, seven, HBK, Shawn Michaels at six, Bam Bam Bigelow at five, Hardcore Holly at three, Diesel at seven, Lex Luger at six, you got Randy Savage at eight people thrown out, but they don't mention that in the statistic. Rick Martel at nine, Ted DiBiase at six, Earthquake at seven, uh, The Undertaker, eight people he's thrown out. Uh, Yokozuna, Yokozuna, seven people he's thrown out. The most anybody has thrown out so far at this point is going to go to 27, and you guessed it. It's him. He's the problem. He's the toxic behavior. Hulk Hogan. It's me. Hi. I'm the problem. It's me. Um, Owen Hart demanded a match against Bret Hart, which Bret repeatedly refused. This situation was complicated because of Bret co-winning the Royal Rumble. Chuck Tunney decided that both Bret Hart and Lex Luger would get separate title shots at WrestleMania 10. A coin toss would determine who was to compete in the first title match, with the other wrestler facing suitable competition. Lex Luger won the coin toss that was televised on Monday Raw. Tunney then made the decision to have Bret Hart wrestle his brother Owen in the opening match at WrestleMania. Had Luger lost the coin toss, he would have faced Crush. Is the reason why they did the whole planning of the seed between both of them earlier on. Owen won the match, but Bret came out of WrestleMania with the WWF World Heavyweight Championship after Yokozuna dropped the title to him. This led to an extended feud between the two that saw Jim Neidhart return to the WWF, WWF to side with Owen Hart, and they wish Smith to make a comeback to take Bret's side. Alright, uh, this is the part of the show where I just tell you... Uh, how many VHS out of 10 do I give this? I'm going to give it a 7. I don't remember much of these matches, except for 2. Let's give it a 5. <laughs> uh, okay, so only 3 uh, matches that I remember. And it was Brett, the Hart Brothers versus uh, Quebecers, the Undertaker versus Yokozuna match, and then the Royal Rumble itself. So, it, you know, that whatever. Am I taking the tape to school to distribute it among my friends? Eh, I could. Or you just tell them. It's like, hey, you gotta watch my Night Raw the next day. Favorite part of the night? Brett and Owen Hart versus the Quebecers. Least favorite part of the night? Razor Ramon with I don't know. I just felt like, eh. Um, that's it. Before I go, something different I want to do. I read this a while back and needed to put this out there. It's an affirmation quote because everyone needs one. Even podcasters and streamers, we all through the mental health problems and we need a little pick-me-up as well. So, here it is. Stop focusing on everyone else's journey and start focusing on your own. You can't recreate their vibe. You can only create your own vibe because we are all different, unique individuals. We all got this. Thank you for listening to the show. Supporting us, you can find us on all of our sort of social platforms at our link tree, linktree.com forward slash from under the apron. It has the link to our network, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, socials, plus our good pods, Spotify, and iTunes accounts, where you can listen to us as well as leave us a comment or a five-star review, which helps us be discovered by other fans of wrestling and podcasts. Check out the show notes for links to other podcasts, trailers that you heard on this episode. Send us a message of your favorite wrestling stories, questions, comments, ratings, or requests by email. It is from under the apron at gmail.com, and I will do my best to get to them and answer accordingly. Thank you for listening and being a huge part of our community. Join us next time for more stories, movies, and TV show reviews, as well as wrestling when we come to you from under the apron. My name is Ernie, and I love you all.